Okay, well, we're in um, Deuteronomy. We're going to finish off uh, chapter 14. So we'll, we'll be beginning in Deuteronomy 14 and verse 22 with my very favorite of topics, tithing. I love, I love preaching on tithing. Love it. In fact, we'll be there all night. No. I'm kidding. I was like, we're not going to do all that. But again, just um, if you haven't been with us for the whole journey through Deuteronomy, it's sort of Moses preaching his last sermon, last sermon to the people of Israel. Um, a lot of people suggest, to, as we look at Deuteronomy, it, it's the mindset of Moses preaching the law, not just telling the law. And, and so he, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to establish in the hearts of these people a quality of living. Uh, for that nation that's going to bless the Lord and, and, and bring the Lord's blessings upon them, okay? But he doesn't exhaustively go through the law like we've seen in, in Exodus and Leviticus. Um, he actually just sort of hits the high points. And of course, he's giving these with the promised land probably literally in view. Um, and, and, he, and, he, and, he's, and he includes, and the Lord includes warnings to be careful to follow these commands in the land. We see that over and over again. So we're going to cover a sort of a broad range of topics uh, under the law, from tithing to concerns for the poor and laws pertaining to the three main feasts of Israel tonight. But um, I, I do hope that as we go along, that there are a couple of of really special moments in our passage tonight where we really get a chance to see something of the, of the Lord's heart towards his people. You know, not just the, the law giving Lord thou shalt, whatever, but actually laws that are designed to bless the people because he cares about them. And, and I'll, I'll try to draw those out as we move along. But we're moving along. We're at verse 22. We're talking about, he's talking about the tithe, reminding the people that they are to by faith give unto the work of the Lord. So verse 22 begins, you shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. In other words, everything that grows from the seeds you plant. Um, it does seem to suggest that uh, maybe there's some grain left over uh, after the, th th this tithe is the, is the grain left over after the seed grain is pulled out that will be needed for the next time they'll be, they'll be sowing seed. But the tithe was certainly from the excess. Um, and so it was assessed on the income, uh, seemingly a little more on the net, not on the total. Uh, God's never unreasonable in this sort of thing. Uh, verse 23 says, And before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose, make his name tithe of your grain, of your wine and of your oil, the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. So when the tithe was delivered to the tabernacle, eventually it'll be the temple in Jerusalem, but for a while it's gonna be the tabernacle. We talked last week, the tabernacle is gonna to move to a few different places in Canaan through the book of Joshua and Judges. But a portion of the tithe was to be enjoyed in a ceremonial meal with the Lord. That's what I love. But I want you to come to my temple and man, we're going to just break bread together. And you're just going to, you're going to, you're going to take this tithe, you're bringing, but you know what? I want you to eat some of it. I want you to enjoy some of it with me. And I just love how the Lord lays that out that way. Um, now he did want to be sure they set aside. And in the Hebrew, a tithe means a tenth, right? And so previously, <clears throat> Moses had indicated that the Israelites' tithes were to go to the Levites back in Numbers 18. But now uh, Moses added a, a new feature to the legislation about the tithe that the Israelites were to take part of their tithe to the, to the temple of their tabernacle and eat it with a common meal with the Lord. So the Levites weren't going to get all of it. Okay? The, the, the Lord wanted to have this, this meal. Uh, and, and he says he wanted, he wanted them to do that, that they might learn to fear the Lord your God always, it says in verse 23. And this experience was designed to teach them to revere Yahweh always to have an awe of God and as they ate this meal before him you know with their priestly instruction and guidance there would be priests there of course they would be acknowledging that their food and thus their lives would depend not only on their on their farming skills but on the blessings of the Lord in their life uh, <clears throat> the paraphrase in the living Bible puts it plainly it says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives and so the tithe really came off the top 
Now it's interesting, but God's so fair. He says, what, what if you live too far away to haul all your tithe, animals and grain and wine all the way to Jerusalem, okay? Look at verse 24. And if the way is too long for you so that you are not able to carry the tithe, when the Lord your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money. Now look at this. Spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. And you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. But that's pretty incredible. Instead of the Lord sort of, for this particular time, instead of laying out these specific things, he says, if you can't bring your animals with you, just turn it into money, come, and then buy but look, whatever your heart desires. And of course, the Baptist must go nuts because it says wine or strong drink. Oh my God, can you imagine God ordaining that, such a thing? God's reasonable, isn't he? The important thing was to be faithful, to come before him. He wanted you to come more than to get every tiny little law right. Come and let's make it a real blessed meal together. You know. And he also reminded him to be generous with the blessings the Lord had given. Don't forget the Levites in your towns. They don't have any money. They don't have, a, they don't have land. They don't have their own cities. They really depend on the people uh, to support them. I think verse 26 is quite a concession on the part of the Lord, allowing these tra traveling from great distance to choose whatever they wanted. Even alcohol, both wine and strong drink were permissible here in an act of worshiping the Lord. Now the Hebrew word for wine is yayin, which sometimes means an intoxicating beverage, but other times a non-intoxicating version. And the Hebrew word that's there for strong drink is sikar, and it's often rendered fermented drink in some translations. So. I do want to say that it's misleading to suggest that that's referring to distilled hard liquor because distillation as a method of making alcohol was not going to occur in the Near East until the 7th century AD. So what they're talking about here is probably something at most like something like beer or something, which is just fermented, but it's not distilled. Okay, So beer or wine, um, they probably have some other names for it. So cross our whiskey. Yeah, what's that? Cross yeah, cross, no whiskey, no bourbon, you know, none of that stuff. Now, while condemning drunkenness and forbidding priests to drink while in the sanctuary, the Bible expected uh, some amount of, 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 of drinking at celebratory occasions, such as weddings and worship. We saw that at the wedding in Cana where Jesus had his first miracle. It was not to just make a bottle of wine, but seven vats, and it wasn't just lousy, weak wine. It was like the best stuff, right? And so anyway... Um, moving on, though, we now read of a special tithe given once every third year, most likely, most likely it's a second yearly tenth tithe redirected toward the needs of the landless and thus the poor. And this tithe was to stay in your community. It wasn't taken to the tabernacle. Look at verse 28. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. Okay. Uh, and the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your town shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Okay? So it is a little, I mean, there's a few different opinions here. So every third year, God wanted his people to be especially observant of the landless Levites and the helpless and needy in their midst. You know, perhaps enough was given in that third year uh, that it could be doled out over the next two years until the third year came along again, right? Um, the question is, was this tithe the tenth that normally went to Jerusalem or to the temple, or is it a second tithe? And in the third year, you're actually now looking at a 20% uh, giving, 10% 10, 10 to God and 10% to the needy, okay? Those that are, that are in need. And it's, it's not inherently clear which that is but here's the deal the new testament certainly urges us to be faithful to give back to the lord doesn't it luke 6 38 jesus says give and it will be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over will be put into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured back to you so jesus was saying as you are generous so 
the Lord, so I will be generous pouring back into your life. And on top of that, we're to be cheerful givers. 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 6, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountiful, bountifully will also reap bountifully. So the New Testament doesn't command how much uh, we should give, but urges us to give in proportion to the blessings we've received from the Lord. You know, the miserly Christian who gives only measly leftovers to the Lord is the loser in the whole realm of giving, you know. So the law of the tithe was provision for the poor anticipates uh, the next legislation we see in chapter 15 concerning debtors, slaves, and other impoverished people. So again, God really is concerned about those that need his help. But we're going to look at the sabbatical year. Verse 1. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall cease what he has lent to his neighbor. You know, every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because of the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Verse 3. Of a foreigner you may exact it, but what whatever of yours is with your brother, in other words, another Jew, your hand shall release. So there's no debt relief for non-Israelites. Okay. So what we're talking about is the sabbatical year, every seventh year, or the year of release. It was commanded in Exodus 23 and Leviticus 25. However, these verses stated that in the seventh year, all it said was that the land was supposed to lie fallow for a year. That you weren't supposed to harvest your land in that sabbatical year. Leave it alone. You can only take from it what it would naturally give. You weren't allowed to go there and trim your vines, you know, your olive olive trees or your vineyards or whatever. You just had to leave it alone and take from the land whatever it could give while you give it rest, right? Only here in, in Deuteronomy does Moses add this additional requirement about debts, right? Now, quite a bit of variation of thought here, and these considerations are based on the simple fact that the land could not be cultivated in the seventh year, and thus production would be quite a bit less than normal. And so there's sort of three ways to look at this debt cancellation uh, in the year of the fields lying fallow. Now, one, some understand this to mean that during the seventh year, debtors do not owe the interest on their loans, but perhaps we're still required to pay the principal payments. It's possible it means that. Secondly, it could mean that debtors do not have to pay anything, interest or principal, during the seventh year, though that loan may continue on in year eight and onward, okay? Third possibility is that the loan lasts only six years. There is no interest or principal due in the seventh year. Thus, loans are always basically six years or less in length. I lean towards the middle one. That, you don't, that, the, that the idea was nobody had to pay anything in the seventh year, but the loan continued to exist beyond that. And that's going to sort of become clear as we move on and look at the Jubilee year, because what happens is we're going we're gonna to read about the Jubilee year. It happens every 50 years, and it clearly states all loans end and are kaput, okay, in, in that 50th year. And so we're thinking that a loan could continue on. Every seventh year you get a break. If you're a little behind, it gives you a year to maybe save up a little bit um, and that sort of thing. But in the 50th year, actually, if you still owe whatever you might owe, it is now forgiven and done and over with. Okay. So I lean towards the fact that I think in the seventh year, you don't pay anything, but, but a loan could continue on in the eighth year. Um, who knows? But God's purpose and plan was to create a situation where there never had to be any poor in the land if his laws were perfectly kept. He says in verse 4, but, but there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess, if only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. Verse 6, for the Lord your God will bless you as he promised you, and he will lend to many, and you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and you shall rule over many nations, but they shall not rule over you. That was God's plans for his people. Unfortunately, I've read the book of Judges, and I've read First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, and the Jews do not keep all of these laws that the Lord had laid out that would have literally resulted in there being no poor in the land of Israel, right? Think about it. If a tithe was taken for the needy every three years, and all debt payments stopped during the seventh year, and all debt was canceled and done away every 50 years, 
the Lord's economic plan truly would have eradicated poverty. I mean, no family beyond you know a generation and a half would ever be in debt. You always, in the 51st year, you're starting clean, no debt. I wish that worked in my life. Yeah. I'm old enough now, I, I could appreciate that. But uh, no, no, no jubilee for me. Don't know about you guys, but they never follow the plan. Um, and here's what's amazing. It's believed that not, in fact, not once did the Jews observe the Jubilee year. Because when we get to the 70 years that Judah will be taken into Babylon, the 70 years was based on 70 times. One year, no, excuse me, that was one year for every year they didn't let it let the land lay fallow. So it was for every sabbatical year, which was every, so there were like uh, 70 sabbatical years they never practice and then they never apparently there's no record in scripture of them ever doing the jubilee year uh, the way the lord had described it sort of got to be the 50th year you know what i mean that's a great plan but you know what we're, we're behind you know we're trying to build some new vineyards and i really need this money and you know i don't know and for whatever reason they never did it okay but we know not one jubilee was ever celebrated verse seven if among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart and shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. So God wants, God wants this land of Canaan. He wants these tribes. He, he wants to be a place where if you come through, it's a place of generosity and compassion. That's what the Lord, it's not, the first thought would be, oh, this is a place of law keeping and everybody's scared to death of their God and all that. No, he wanted to be a land of generosity and compassion. That's what you would sense when you came into his promised land. That was the Lord's desire, right? Verse 9, take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, you say. The seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cry to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin so this is talking about the sabbatical year the seventh year um, uh, to not so so it's almost like too that if, if, if someone owed you something you, you release that debt but you actually shouldn't leave them penniless either he's sort of saying you should you know not you should not begrudgingly give them nothing the Lord considers it sin to not be generous even in that seventh year. Verse 10 goes on, you shall give to him freely and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Now it's interesting, back in verse four it just said, there will never be poor. And now down here he says, but in reality, there will never cease to be poor. Why? God knows the future, God knows what's gonna happen. So he goes on in verse 11, Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, to the poor in your land. So you saw the promised land to be a place populated by gracious, generous, and compassionate people, giving the poor a hand up whenever necessary. You know, I think you know, maybe Solomon was meditating on these words of Moses when he wrote in Proverbs 11:24. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty saying if you're not generous the Lord's not going to bless your life you, by trying to hoard it you're only doing yourself damage um, so God didn't guarantee prosperity for everyone in Israel but he did guarantee the opportunity for prosperity if Israel remained an obedient nation okay so it was an if then if you do well the outcome will be no poverty that would have been nice now, this, this moves into another interesting thing about the release of slaves every seventh year, verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you therefore I command you this today okay now there's no question that sometimes a, a, a Jewish let's just say the, the, the father the, the, the husband simply couldn't make ends meet and he would become what, what we might call an indentured servant to another landowner but you could only do that for six years 
and in the seventh year he had to be released. Maybe he owed that landowner something. Whatever it was, he, he, he worked himself to freedom in six years and in the seventh year, God's commanding that if you have a Hebrew who's working for you as, as a slave, okay, that you're to let him go in the seventh year, okay? So as debts were canceled every seventh year, so were slaves to be free. Now the slaves thought of here are those who had to sell themselves because of, because of debt. And so the Lord sort of wanted the law to, to, to assure that bankruptcy didn't harm an Israelite for all his life, that the worst that could happen is they'd have to serve someone without pay for six years. That would be the, the worst case scenario, right? Um, and then God commanded generosity to this departing a servant or slave and I think it will also give the slave to be freed greater incentive to please who will soon be his ex-master right because you would like to to be blessed when you depart but he, what's interesting the next the next section would well, clearly some people prefer this life of serving a master not having to worry about survival and making enough money and all um, verse 16 but if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he is well off with you, then you shall take an all and put it through his ear into the door and he shall be your slave forever. And your female slave, you shall do the same. Okay? So this is someone says, you know what? I sure like a life where I don't have to worry about anything. I just wake up every morning and I serve this family. It's a good family. I, for some reason, I was thinking of Downton Abbey. Is any Downton Abbey fans in here? It was interesting in, 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 in British higher classes that, that, that shows about the, the, the rich family and then all the servants that live downstairs, you know? And these people, these people that served the manor had chosen a life of service. And, and marriage was honestly frowned upon. It was very, I mean, you might go your whole life as, and never marry man or woman uh, you got a tiny amount of money but not enough to like ever be able to go out and, and do much with it perhaps um, and so uh, I think the same ideas here if this person would, would, would just I love serving this family and I'm just happy to do that for the rest of my life you know and, and so that's the idea so Jesus is the great fulfillment of this willing slave pictured here you know, there's a couple of passages you know sometimes we can this was, as in my study, I came across this. Jesus said prophetically in Psalm 40 and verse 6, My ears you have opened. My ears you have opened. And it may be, Jesus may have been alluding to that in speaking of the opening of the ear in this bond slave ceremony. You opened my, I opened my ear to be a slave to you, Father. You know, interesting, isn't it? Um, he, he was the willing bond slave of God the Father. Likewise, in Isaiah 50, in verses 5 to 7, it shows that Jesus' character uh, as the willing slave was mostly perfect, perfectly shown in his sufferings at the cross. And it says this in Isaiah 50, in verse 5, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheek to those who plucked out the beard. Okay, so that's a prophetic passage in Isaiah about Christ's suffering. But again, this idea, the Lord opened my ear. Do you think Jesus ever had a hard time hearing God? I think it's interesting that maybe this turn of phrase is actually pointing to this, this a picture of this idea of, of, of Jesus just saying, I am, the, I am the bond servant of God. Jesus is willing to do that. But you know what? Then he asks us to do that. Right. So the Christian is also to be a willing uh, bond servant of Christ. The, the common New Testament word doulos describes this kind of a slave. That's, that's the Greek word for the Hebrew, okay? And, and one writer said of a doulos, a slave, a bond servant, uh, one who is a permanent relation of servitude to another among the Greeks, with their strong sense of personal freedom, the term carried a degrading connotation. But the New Testament gives it great value to the Christian serving Christ. So to a Greek, the last thing he'd want to be called is a doulos one of these slaves, one of these indentured servants. But in the New Testament, it's a beautiful picture of serving Christ, serving others, being humble, being taking the lower place. Uh, always, Jesus kept said, you know, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. The greatest among you shall be the least. He did it again and again, and that's the idea that we get in the New Testament. So anyway, moving on in verse 18, 
it shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free from you for it. So now this is sort of probably getting back to the one that he releases, right? It shall not seem hard to you when you let him go free from you for at half the cost of a hired worker, he has served you six years. You know, in other words, God's saying, just look at how much money you saved. Okay, you had to feed him some barley and wheat. Okay, maybe a little bit of lamb now and again, but listen, you're way ahead. So the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. Just realize what a blessing he's been. So have a good attitude about letting these, these servants go if that's what they choose to do. Verse 19, we look at the principle of, of the firstborn. <clears throat> Verse 19, all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock, you shall dedicate to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd nor shear the firstborn of your flock. Okay, they're to be dedicated to the Lord. It means set apart to the Lord. Uh, the firstborn uh, was always to be to be saved. A firstborn animal was not to be used as a normal domesticated animal. Okay, because you would want to save him for one of these years. You're going to have to go to the temple or the tabernacle with a perfect first sacrifice, a firstborn lamb or oxen or whatever. And so these would would be set apart uh, to the Lord when when that time came. Okay. It's a reminder to the Israelites that they were God's firstborn. He chose these people out of Egypt to be his people. So they were the firstborn of all mankind, right? And um, also, the firstborn was thought to always be the best, and the best was always to be given to God. Okay, and so that's sort of something that's seen in, in Scripture a lot. It's interesting, in the area of produce, <laughs> of vegetation and all of you, I mean, crops, right? The first fruits is another picture of this very same thing first fruits uh, in the area of crops. And, and all of these things demonstrated faith that the Lord of the harvest uh, was going to make up whatever you put aside. You know, you maybe you put this firstborn animal aside, but he's going to replace that in the herd. You're going to bring your first fruit, first fruits from your field. The, the God, God is going to replace that because of your faithfulness. Verse 20. You shall eat it, you and your household, before the Lord your God, year by year, at the place that the Lord will choose. Uh, Gilgal will be the first place the Lord chooses, by the way. I mentioned that last week. 21, but if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish, what's, whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Okay, so if your firstborn lamb has like got three legs and one eye, not going to work, okay? In spite of him being firstborn, that is not going to be a satisfactory animal. So it, it would, that rule would probably not apply, right? Um, verse 22, you shall eat it within your towns. Just chow down on it at home there. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it as though it were a gazelle or a deer. In other words, there's nothing sacrificially special about it. It's just like wild game. 23, only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it out on the ground like water. Okay. Now, the other thing I read that... Um, you, if, if your firstborn, if all you had was a marginal animal, you could still sell it. People would still buy it for its meat, right? And yet you were allowed to then take that money and again go to Jerusalem and do that thing where you buy something at the sacrifice there at Jerusalem. And probably only slightly elevated prices, right? Uh, around the temple. But so if there's any defect in it, that was the case. It wasn't sacrificed. How interesting that that sin, as far as sin goes, we're blind, lame, and full of blemishes, aren't we? And, 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 but yet we're accepted as living sacrifices because we're covered by the blood of the perfect lamb, okay, the firstborn of God, right? The, the spotless lamb, Jesus, I love that. Chapter 16, we're doing good. We're gonna look at um, uh, <clears throat> three festivals are mentioned in chapter 16. Uh, some suggest these are the three most important annual feasts, uh, which all male Israelites were supposed to attend every year. Um, your family could attend. They were invited, but they weren't required to come. But men were supposed to come every year, if at all possible. Okay. Um, attending these feasts gave the Israelites, I think, an opportunity to acknowledge the Lord as their deliverer and provider. Uh, to express their faith in the Lord as they left their families in God's care to maybe make a really long trip on foot uh, to, to Jerusalem or wherever it ended up being. And then we're going to see these festivals 
were supposed to demonstrate that worshiping God was to be a joyful experience. It wasn't this dreadful, serious, you know, it's like, it was a celebration. The Jews celebrated the worship of, of their God. God wanted that, okay? So let's look at the first one, um, uh, the Passover, the Passover. It says, observe the month of Abib, that would be March, April, okay, depending on moons and stuff, and keep the Passover to the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. You shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. So the Feast of Passover, um, <clears throat> most of these, all, all these feasts have a symbolic value in Christ. Every time we look at them, we go, I think this is also a picture of Christ. Prophetically, the Feast of Passover clearly presents Jesus as our Passover lamb. The Lamb of God who was sacrificed and whose blood was received and applied. So the wrath of God passes over us. That's exactly what happens. The wrath of God passes over us because of what Christ has done. Paul said as much in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So Paul saw that picture, that that's who Jesus was. And so just as the Israelites applied the blood of their lamb over their doorposts in, in, in Egypt, so we too are to apply the blood of Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, I don't know, over our lives for, for, for to be delivered from an eternal life in hell. Okay, that, that's our Passover. Okay, I claim the blood of Jesus at my house. Okay, or wherever I'm going. Verse 3 goes on, You shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread the bread of affliction for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt okay so the Passover is the first day but the next week is actually the feast of unleavened bread it's a seven-day feast okay um, but it's not mentioned here uh, the first Passover the unleavened bread was a practical necessity they they left Egypt in a big hurry that night um, while everybody was mourning the death of the firstborn, they were, they were trying to get on out of town before people started um, maybe attacking them. But um, at any rate, uh, for that first week, the thought is that when they first left, all the bread they had was unleavened. They didn't have time to let it rise, right? So they had to make uh, the unleavened bread to get through those first few days. Verse 4, No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You had to eat all your Passover meal that night and then <clears throat> burn anything left over as a sacrifice before the next morning. Okay. Leaven was, of course, a picture of sin and corruption uh, because of the way that just a little bit of leaven influences a whole lump of dough. Um, and just as uh, leaven puffs up a lump of bread, so pride and sin can puff up our spirits too. Something that God's not very pleased with. Um, significantly, God called them to walk. Uh, excuse me, God called them you know, to eat unleavened bread after their initial deliverance. Um, and what that was saying too, he was saying, uh, he was calling them to a pure walk with me. That was the picture trying to be painted prophetically the feast of unleavened bread was symbolized by christ's three days in the tomb a celebration of jesus's burial a sinless body laid in a tomb but also a body in no way decaying still perfect no leaven in it right okay now three days not seven but three days during which he was received by god the father is holy and complete and acceptable Verse 5 goes on, You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt. Um, you remember they were in a hurry to get Jesus off the cross because it was time for the Passover for most of the people. So uh, for them to be eating their Passover meal. Okay? And so... Um, that's interesting. We just see that picture here as well. And, and, so, and so again, you, you couldn't just, hey, I can't make it to Jerusalem, so we're just going to celebrate Passover here in whatever little Bethlehem or something. No, no, no. God says, right, you only sac eat that sacrifice at, at the temple, at the tabernacle. Okay. It was interesting. Only the very first one was done in their homes. And then everyone after that was 
told to be done at the tabernacle and then eventually at the temple. Uh, just showing, I think God just wants people to come together again. Hey, you're one nation. This is an act of unity. This is an act of that we're all one, right? It says, verse 7, You shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose, and in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. So Passover is a single day observance. It morphed right into the six day feast of unleavened bread, ended on the seventh day. We also have a celebration called the Feast of First Fruits. And it was the third day after Passover, also not mentioned in this passage. Um, it was the very first harvest of the barley crop, okay? And with it came specific animal sacrifices, speaking again of rest and the blood and work of another. They were specifically warned not to eat of this grain harvest in any form whatsoever until they had made their first fruits offering. So you had to come offer your first fruits before you could take anything from your fields and eat it yourself, right? And so what's this a picture of? Well, we don't have to guess. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us that on the third day, when our Lord rose from the dead, he was the first fruits of God's harvest. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 begins, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So we see uh, the Apostle Paul making a connection to the celebration of first fruits being on the third day after Passover, which was the day Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits um, of, of, of those who rise from the dead. Interesting too that first fruits were to be, the, the celebration of the first fruits was to be offered on the day after the Sabbath. Um, which makes it Sunday morning, so this is the Lord's Day, the day of resurrection. Um, so Easter morning is, is, the, is the day of the celebration of the Feast of First Fruits. Moving on though, nine, verse nine. We have the, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. Verse nine says, you shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of a free will offering from your the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. So the feast of weeks or Pentecost was a feast associated with a, the joy of harvest, during which Israelites brought a free will offering to the Lord as a demonstration of their thanks. A free will offering was whatever you feel like. Free will is listen. You don't have to bring anything. But if you think I, that I, your Lord, have blessed you and blessed your harvest, then you should want to bring something, right? It was an offering given in response to your sense of God's blessings. It was from a thankful heart. Verse 11 goes on, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. The Lord wants this to be a happy time, right? You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter and your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. So all of these people can be present for this, this particular uh, sacrifice uh, at Pentecost, this free will offering, okay? Verse 12, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. You shall be careful to observe these statutes, okay? So there was no ritual of sacrifice commanded at Pentecost. Instead, it was a time of joyful thanksgiving for the harvest. Whereas I mentioned the earlier one was about the barley harvest. It's thought that Pentecost had to do with the first harvest of the wheat harvest at that time of year in the Middle East in those days. Okay. Um, if you do the math and get on a calendar, work it all out, it's interesting that Pentecost falls on Sunday as well, uh, that last day. Um, further evidence that God, I think, has shifted the day of celebration for believers to the first day of the week. And the heart of this feast was a first fruits offering. Um, and then it also mentions two loaves baked with leaven and offered to the Lord. It was a feast of thanksgiving, okay? Um, okay, just want to make sure. Um, it's specified that, that the two, two loaves baked with leaven, so that's different than unleavened bread, right? So it's come together. Now you might remember that what happened on Pentecost as far as the church. On that day, the disciples were gathered in the upper room. Holy Spirit 
comes down on them and a new body of believers will form the church made up no longer of Jews alone but as Peter announced of Jews and Gentiles these two loaves these two sinful bodies representing one unity now okay and as the Holy Spirit took up residence in, in men and women still capable of sinning you know that the leaven if you will was still there this was a testimony that God would work in his people and he would, you know, judge their sin and bring it, help us to bring it under control. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? And help us bring our sin under control. You know, we're never going to be in this life the example of perfection that Christ was, right? But nevertheless, we're going to be an expression of God's fellowship with us. And these two loaves, the Jews and the Gentiles, really had been at work all through the history of the world since then, to some degree, okay? The churches that exist today is beautifully symbolized by these two loaves, filled with the Spirit, still sinners, but saved by grace, right? Now, between Pentecost and the Feast of Booths, there are two other feasts not mentioned here in Deuteronomy. The Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, and the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But we're just going to look at the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, okay? Uh, starts in verse 13. This was a seven-day feast begun on the Sabbath day, that would be Saturday, the Feast of Tabernacles was so called because the, the Israelites after the fall harvest were to live for one week in little huts. They, they would make these little lean-tos. They still do it in Israel. They just get palm branches and, and wood or lumber and they build just these little lean-tos and for seven days every night they go out and they sleep in this to remind them of the 30 the 40 years in the wilderness when they didn't have permanent homes. Okay, To be a reminder. And I know people today that still do it um, even Christians that think we have to do all of these feasts, there are some Christians that believe that strongly, and, and, and they actually build huts in their backyard here in Satellite Beach and go out and sleep in them for a week. I think, I think we're freed from, from that um, in the New Testament, but just saying it, I've heard, I've, I've talked to people that believe that. Um, verse 13, you shall keep the feast of booths for seven days when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast. God wants us to rejoice, man, when we come to him. He wants you to rejoice. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, Levi the sojourner, and the fatherless, and the widow are within your towns. Everyone wants to participate. For seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord your God at the place that he will choose because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands and then why why is the God gonna bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that we will be all together joyful you see the sequence God wants to bless us so we will be all together joyful what an awesome God what an awesome that's his reason not to show how powerful he is, look how all my people fall right in line, all these robotic, no. So we will be altogether joyful. That's why God do, does the things he does, okay? Their lives will be joy-filled when their hearts are faith-filled. It's as simple as that. And so the Feast of Tabernacles speaks of the millennial reign, if we're looking at parallels to the New Testament. A lot of people look at the Feast of Tabernacles as representative of the millennial reign of Christ. It's all about peace and rest from beginning to end. Um, and in Zechariah chapter 14, this particular, and there's a prophecy of the millennial reign. And in Zechariah 14, the Feast of Tabernacles is specifically said to be celebrated during the millennium. Okay, so anyway, verse 16, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Um, so these were considered to be maybe the most important feasts in Israel, at least as Moses understood it and as the Lord wanted con conveyed at this point. And every Jewish man to the best of his ability was to to come every year and celebrate it. You know, Jesus was obedient to this command. Um, he made the trip from Galilee to Jerusalem to be at these feasts. We have the story that in Luke chapter two and John chapter seven, where Jesus specifically traveled from the Galilee to Jerusalem for these feasts. So he even honored it uh, during his life. Verse 18, we wrap up just sort of looking at justice 
interesting. We're trying to nominate a Supreme Court justice right now. And again, we get a really cool picture of what's important to God. What's important to him? Verse 18, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. Okay, so much for the Old Testament not saying judge not. It definitely says to judge, make judgments. Now these are judges and officers, but they are to judge sin, undoubtedly, but also to judge in cases and things like that. But how often have you heard Jesus never, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. True, but he also, Jesus also said, John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So whenever you get somebody going, you're not supposed to judge, Jesus said not to judge. No, well, check out John 7, 24. Okay. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. So we are to, to, to judge, you know, sinful behavior and, and, and call it out. But, you know, we're to call out, we're, we're, we're to share that in love, right? Verse 19, you shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Okay? Is not every word of that necessary and true today in our justice system? You know, but how amazing, you know, they don't want anything from the Bible in a courtroom anymore. But, you know, 5,000 years ago, God's laying out what we consider a good court, a good legal system, a good justice system. You know, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. But isn't it interesting? He's talking about bribes. It did not take long for man to figure out how to get around laws, go bribe the judge, you know. So, man, we've been trying to circumvent the law as long as there have been laws. Just about done. Forbidden forms of worship. You shall not plant any tree such as an asura beside the altar of the Lord your God that you shall make. And you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates. And so really, it looks like maybe another responsibility of judges was to prevent impure worship practices in the land. Okay, anything that might lead to accommodating uh, the worship, accommodating the worship of the Lord to the resident pagan worship systems was to be completely avoided, okay? Now, they're talking about, they talk about any wooden, uh, any Asura, Asura pole or tree, that's symbolic of Asura, the goddess of fertility and consort of Baal. And then it talks about a sacred stone, a stone pillar would be symbolic of male fertility. Uh, actually, in, in Israel in November, when we toured around, we went up to a place called Dan, and we actually saw some ancient altars to the pagan gods, and sure enough, they would have these they, they, they were just stone pillars, but they were like this high. There'd be actually three of them often, okay? But, but, but God's saying none of that stuff. So anyway, we end with that little tidbit about don't, don't risk polluting the worship of me with the junk you're going to find in Canaan when you go in. Destroy it all, okay? So anyway, tonight, we've been reminded to give generously, right? Especially to those in need. God is worried about the helpless and the poor. So we should be too. And we shouldn't be miserly. We should be ready to bless when blessing is called for. Uh, God's economy was set up to be sure that poverty was rare or absent. If people followed his law, he actually set up a pretty good system to help people get through difficult financial times in their life, even back in those days, right? And then we looked at the feast and saw there that God expected his people to rejoice. I mean, of all of that, I just kept seeing rejoice when you come before me, and I've, I've, I've given you all this stuff so that you will be joyful. And God wants us to be, my favorite verse, six, chapter 16, verse 15. The Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you will be altogether joyful. So our lives are to be joy-filled, and that begins when our hearts are faith-filled, right? God will pour into that. So. God wants to bless us, and he knows what's best for us, and so we should pay close attention. Because really, his guidance, his laws, Old Testament or New, are for our benefit. Amen? Okay. And what you guys offer early tonight. Anyway. Let's pray.